All right, we are going to get going on tonight's webinar on student loan strategies and disability insurance for resident and fellow physicians on this historic day. My name is Jay Weinberg and I'd like to, number one, thank you for doing what you do in this very uncertain time. And um, I want to invite anybody that's on here uh, whether it's live or a recording, if you would like to block out some time to discuss your specific situation, please do not hesitate to reach out. Uh, you can go ahead and scan this QR code on the bottom left-hand side of your screen, which will add me to the contacts of your cell phone, or you can go ahead and complete our questionnaire at pgy1.com. This will take about a minute or two and uh, whatever financial or insurance, topic, insurance topics you would like to discuss, I'm more than happy to do so. I do not charge fees, and everything that we discuss will be confidential. A brief introduction about myself. I'm a financial planner, and I've been in this line of work for over 20 years. My practice is exclusively with physicians, and in a given year, I lecture to somewhere around 100 or so residency and fellowship programs. The topics uh, that I typically lecture on are going to be student loan strategies and tax filing considerations, disability insurance, home ownership and mortgage options, life insurance and Roth IRAs. And if you feel that a lecture would be beneficial to your respective program, please reach out to me and I would be more than happy to uh, to, to put a time on the schedule uh, during a didactic block, or we could do it after hours if that's easier from a scheduling standpoint, and we can certainly uh, uh, get something going for your specific program or institution. Now, with that said, uh, this evening, I narrowed it down to two topics. It's gonna be student loan strategies and disability insurance. And with that, hot off the press because this came out just a couple of hours ago. The government extended the CARES Act provisions through the end of September 2021. And what that means is that if you have government direct loans, there is going to be zero interest and zero payments through the end of September of this year. Furthermore, these zero payments, as long as you're engaged in one of their repayment options, are going to count as qualifying payments for the purposes of public service loan forgiveness. And who knows what will happen after September, but that's still a decent uh, ways down the road. So, so hopefully um, uh, much of the uh, damage that has been done uh, with the coronavirus um, is hopefully starting to subside. Uh, by then, and um, we'll we'll see uh, we'll see what the future brings after this. But this is a, a decent amount of time for the extension. I feel that this is uh, wonderful and welcome news, and it's it's terrific uh, for many resident and fellow physicians that are making fifty or sixty or seventy thousand dollars to be able to save that three or four or five hundred dollars per month that goes a long way. And if you had that money allocated in your budget towards student loans, uh, maybe um, it, it'll allow you to do some other financial items that may benefit you um, uh, <clears throat> as well. So on an individual basis, you know, we can most certainly talk about your specific situation and come up with a plan for you. Now, when it comes to student loans, there's going to be several factors that are going to determine what the option, what the best option or strategy is uh, for you. So what kind of loans do you have? Are they government loans? Are they private loans? Are they government loans that might be direct loans or might they be government loans that are not direct loans? Are you going for public service loan forgiveness if you have the right type of government loans? Marital status, are you single? Are you married? Do you have dependents? If you're married, how much money does your spouse make and do they also have government direct loans? And in the event you're going towards public service loan forgiveness, how long have you been making the qualifying payments to try and get to that goal of 120 months? 
So these are the items that you're going to take into consideration when coming up with a strategy on your loans. And when it comes to elections, I did not map out every last election for you. I mapped out typically what I'm seeing when I speak to the respective residency and fellowship programs. And the most common of the repayment elections is going to be what they call repay. If I had to put a number on it, I would say that roughly 75% of residents and fellows either are on repay or should be on repay. Repay is the newest of the income driven options from the government and it was rolled out in December of 2015. So it just had its five year birthday. Repay stands for revised pay as you earn. And some of the specs on repay is that the payment amount is going to be 10% of your household income. And that's going to be regardless of tax filing status. So if you're single, that's a moot point. But if you are married, it's not only going to be based upon your income, it's going to also take into account your spouse's income. Repay counts towards public service loan forgiveness if that's the road you're going down. The best part about repay is that there's a credit or a subsidy of one half of your unpaid interest, which we have a dedicated slide for in just a few minutes. One of the downsides to repay, but it's oftentimes a moot point, is that there's no cap of the 10-year standard repayment on repay. And what that simply means is when you're in attending, you probably don't want to be on repay anymore. And repay is eligible for those of you that have direct loans. Now, when I talk about these percentage payments, please remember that due to these modifications on loans due to the CARES Act, there's going to be zero payments on your government direct loans right now. So this is how it used to be prior to the CARES Act, and this is how it will be after the CARES Act. The next option is going to be PAYE, which stands for pay as you earn. Some of the same characteristics as repay, but some totally different characteristics. So with PAYE, the payment amount is going to be 10% of your discretionary income. And I stress discretionary because if you are married, you have the ability to file your taxes separately and only have to pay based upon your income and your loan amount. Not everybody's eligible for PAYE. You have to be a quote unquote newer borrower. So if you had government loans prior to the fall of 2007, this will likely knock you out of eligibility to be on PAYE. PAYE does count towards public service loan forgiveness, and it's available for those of you that have government direct loans. The next option, which oftentimes made sense uh, prior to the CARES Act and will again make sense for government loans after the CARES Act, is what they call a private refinance. This is essentially where you take your loans from one servicer and change them to another servicer. So for example, let's say you have loans with the government and you do a private refinance and you'll end up with a company like a SoFi or a Laurel Road. Now, when and where does a private refinance make sense? So first and foremost, if there's any chance you're going towards public service loan forgiveness on government direct loans, you do not want to engage in a private refinance because once you take loans away from the government, you're giving up the ability for that public service loan forgiveness. Now, it's a different story if you have private loans. If private loans aren't eligible for forgiveness anyway, but government loans, if there's any chance you're going for public service loan forgiveness, don't even think about a private refinance. And if you're looking for lower interest rates and lower monthly payments. Now, once again, the government has extended until or through, I should say, the end of September 2021, 
zero interest and zero payments. It doesn't get any better than that for student loans. So that's likely why you do not want to engage in a private refinance on government loans right now. Now, it'll likely change once they remove these, um, these modifications for the CARES Act, but for the next nine months, probably does not make sense to do a private refinance on government direct loans. The last option is what they call forbearance. Think of this as punting, where you're not making any payments, the interest is gonna capitalize, it doesn't count towards public service loan forgiveness. If at all possible, you do not want to be on forbearance. So let's go through some scenarios. <clears throat> and once again, things are a little bit different for the next nine months, but it's only a matter of time before we get back to normal. So let's say you're single and you have government direct loans, less than $100,000, and you have income of that of a resident or a fellow, you're not gonna get it wrong no matter what you do. You could do PAYE or repay or maybe even do a private refinance, especially if you're not going towards public service loan forgiveness. Now, if you're single and you have government direct loans, more than $100,000, an income of that of a resident or a fellow, you're gonna to wanna to be on repay. If you are married and your spouse does not have income or has very little income, and you have income of that of a resident or a fellow, and you have more than $100,000 in government direct loans, you're gonna to wanna to be on repay and likely file your taxes joint. If you are married and your spouse has comparable income and your spouse has comparable loan amounts, both you and your spouse are gonna to wanna to both likely be on repay and file your taxes married filing joint. Now the one-off scenario here is if you are married to somebody that makes really good money and does not have loans, there's been many situations where repay makes the most sense. Now this is the one scenario where repay is not gonna make sense because as we discussed previously, repay goes off of household income regardless of tax filing status. So if you're married to somebody that makes good money and has very little or no government direct loans, you're gonna engage different strategies. So if you're going for public service loan forgiveness, you're gonna to wanna to likely file your taxes separately and be on PAYE. If you are not going for public service loan forgiveness, that may be a time where you look to do a private refinance. And if you do that, you'll file your taxes joint. But once again, with zero payment and zero interest, you can sort of sit on the sidelines right now and not stress, about, stress out about a higher payment because on the government loans, everybody's going to have <clears throat> zero interest and zero payments, assuming you have government direct loans. Public service loan forgiveness. I'm sure everybody on this webinar has heard about public service loan forgiveness. Unfortunately, much of the talk about public service loan forgiveness is in a negative connotation. So back in the fall of 2007, the government rolled out a program called Public Service Loan Forgiveness, or PSLF. They said if you have the right type of loans and you work at the right type of place and you make the right type of payments, you are going to be eligible for tax-free public service loan forgiveness. So what kind of loans count? Government direct loans. Not all government loans are direct loans. If you have Fell loans or you have Perkins loans, they do not fit the bill for government direct loans. However, there is a way you can change the face of Fell loans or Perkins loans. It's a little bit complicated, so you're gonna to wanna to speak to somebody that is either a student loan specialist or really knows the ins and outs of student loans prior to changing the face of Fell loans or Perkins loans. You gotta be working at the right type of place. That's going to be a government 
or a nonprofit 501c3 entity. The vast majority of residency programs and most fellowship programs as well do fit the bill for that nonprofit 501c3 entity. If you are unsure about it, reach out to the GME and confirm with them. You don't want to make that mistake and end up thinking that you're clocking time while you're actually not clocking time. That can be a major mistake. And last, you have to make 120 qualifying payments. Qualifying payments are going to be IBR, pay as you earn, repay, 10-year standard. If you do A, B, and C, you will be eligible for tax-free public service loan forgiveness. A couple of tidbits. If you are going for public service loan forgiveness, you do not want to overpay on your loans for several reasons. Number one, public service loan forgiveness is tax-free. So why in the world would you pay extra if it what if it's going to be tax-free forgiveness of whatever the amount is on the back end? So it doesn't matter if you have a hundred thousand, two hundred, or three hundred thousand that gets forgiven. Why would you pay extra? The entire amount's going to get forgiven. Furthermore, if you pay extra or more than your minimum required payment, it puts you into something called paid ahead status. Paid ahead status trips up the calculation system that these loan servicers use to calculate how many payments you've made. <clears throat> Additionally, it's not required, but it is highly suggested that you complete your employment certification forms annually. When you submit these forms, your servicer is going to come back to you and say, you know, Dr. Smith, you have X amount of, of qualifying payments logged. And I can't tell you how many times you may think that you have a certain amount of time logged, come to find that your loan servicer does not even have you logged for anything close to that. So the sooner or the earlier you find out about any discrepancies, the sooner you can try to get those issues rectified. There was an article a few years ago about public service loan forgiveness where they said 99% of people that went for public service loan forgiveness were not eligible or did not qualify. And I want to say that this was the media stirring the pot on public service loan forgiveness. And the reason why is that if you read into that article, you saw that it said that 70% of the people, they didn't have the right type of loans and 50% of the people, they weren't working at the right place and 30% of the people, heck, they couldn't even do the paperwork. However, the silver lining is that there were several people that did qualify for public service loan forgiveness. And Personally, I know people that have qualified and as we mature and as there's better information that, that, that is being brought to the public on this program, we are all going to know more and more and more people that do qualify. So this program is alive and well, it's not going anywhere and I can promise you that we're all going to know many, many people over time that do qualify for public service loan forgiveness. And I'm sure there will be several on this webinar that do qualify as well. Now, we spent a lot of time talking about repay. So let's give an example. And there's been several people that joined uh, on uh, a few minutes late. So, so I just want to state that um, this example was valid up until a few months back prior to them making the modifications for the CARES Act. And it's not going to become truly um, valid again with regard to numbers until these, these modifications are lifted, uh, which 
are now scheduled to go through the end of September 2021. But let's just uh, pretend that things are back to normal. So here's a basic example of repay. Let's say you have $200,000 of government loans at 6% interest. That's going to get you $12,000 a year of interest. Let's say your payment is going to be $250 per month. That's going to get you $3,000 in payments. So if you have $12,000 of interest and you're paying $3,000, there's going to be $9,000 of unpaid interest. With repay, there's a subsidy or a credit of one half of that unpaid interest. So rather than your loans growing from, say, $200,000 to $209,000, your loans are going to grow from $200,000 up to $200,000 or $204,500. So if you can get three, four, five, six good years out of repay, you may be able to save yourself maybe twenty, forty, fifty, or sixty thousand dollars if and when the time comes to pay these loans back. So when the modifications are are lifted, if you're not on repay and you feel like it would be beneficial, by all means jump on it. Furthermore, you do not have to be on your annual re-up to change into repay you can do a mid-cycle transfer into repay. We spent a lot of time talking about private refinance as well over the past 15 or 20 minutes. So where do they make sense? Well, number one, if you're planning on going for public service loan forgiveness and you have government loans that are direct, do not go for a private refinance because once again, once you take those loans that are government direct loans away from the government, you can no longer uh, put them back with the government and you're, you're disqualifying your, your chances for public service loan forgiveness. You need to have a good credit score. If the benefits of repay are not a favorable option, if you have high interest rate government loans or private loans, this is when you may want to look into a private refinance. So. If you have private loans right now where you have a high payment or a high interest rate, that would be a terrific opportunity to do a private refinance right now. The rates on private refinances are the lowest that I think they've ever been. And there's two companies out there that have terrific refinance programs for residents and fellows, as well as attendings too. But um, uh, if you're a resident or a fellow and you think a private refinance would make sense, the two companies you want to be looking at are going to be Laurel Road and SoFi. And feel free to um, copy down these, these links or take a screenshot or scan that QR code because these QRs will uh, enable you to get um, either uh, percentage uh, discounts or, or cash back rewards. And the program that both Laurel Road and SoFi has allows for $100 per month payments while you are in your training years. And they give you a six month grace period after your training. And it's not until six months out or six months into you being an attending physician, that's when your quote unquote normal payment will kick in. So if you have private loans now, I would highly suggest taking a look at a private refinance. You might be surprised at how competitive these interest rates are. And furthermore, uh, possibly having a, a payment of $100 per month could really benefit you from a cash flow standpoint. So um, feel free to use these links. And once again, I said this at the beginning of the webinar. If you want to block out some time to discuss your specific situation, I'm happy to do so. I do not charge fees and I'll do whatever I can to, to, to assist or, or point you in the right direction if it's, if it's an area that I may not be um, uh, specializing in. The next topic we're going to get into is disability insurance. And this is my specialty. 
I've been in this line of work for over 20 years. I'm one of the top disability insurance brokers in the country. Uh, in a given year, I speak to over 100 residency and fellowship programs. And, and last year, I had over 500 physicians uh, utilize our services to secure comprehensive individual disability insurance policies. When it comes to disability insurance, the most important feature within a policy is what they refer to as own occupation. Own occupation is the litmus test that insurance companies use to say that if something were to happen to you, would we as an insurance company have to pay out on the policy? And if I were to show you five different policies from five different companies, they all have different wording for own occupation. It's not a one size fits all. It's not like a gallon of gas where it really doesn't matter what station you get it from. This is specific to the company and it's specific to the policy. The highest level of own occupation, it's what they refer to as medical specialty specific true own occupation. And I'll give you an example of this. Let's say you are an orthopedic surgeon and the lion's share of your, your, your time and income is derived from, from your surgical procedures. Well, you know, God forbid something were to happen to your hand or your eyes or your back or your shoulder or whatever it might be. But if something were to happen to you and you can no longer prov provide those um, or perform those surgical procedures, you would be able to receive full benefits on your policy, even if you stay in a non-operative setting, whether it be non-op um, ortho, non-op sports, or you know you could do telemedicine or anything outside of the scope of medicine. But if you can't do your exact skill set that you were doing prior to uh, being injured, uh, you would be able to receive full benefits on the policy and be eligible to uh, earn a full paycheck doing whatever else you do, regardless of how much money you make doing those other things. That's the highest level. And there are very, very, very few policies out there that have that particular wording. A couple of the other definitions that I always like to touch on um, are down uh, towards the bottom here where it says modified own occupation or one company refers to this as the medical definition. With these definitions they say if you cannot perform your job we're going to pay out on the policy as long as you are not doing another job. I'm going to say that again. We're going to pay out on the policy as long as you are not doing another job. And if you are doing something else, it's either going to reduce or your or eliminate your ability to collect on the policy. I have yet to meet a physician that is comfortable with this wording in their policy. However, there are a tremendous amount of policies out there that have this very scaled back wording within them. The lowest level, which actually is not even own occupation, it's what they call any gainful occupation. And I typically see this in group disability insurance policies. So th this definition states that if you can perform the duties of any gainful occupation, you would not be eligible to collect on this policy. So essentially, if you can do anything, you cannot collect. You never want to rely on a group disability insurance policy. It's always going to be in your best interest to get a comprehensive individual policy that sits in first position. And then if they give you a group policy, have it layer behind. And the reason why that certain policies have this any gainful occupation wording within them is because, you know, let's say you go to work for, for 
a hospital that has a thousand employees and they're given this disability insurance to everybody. They know that they're bringing on the good, the bad, and the unhealthy. Well, the only way that they could curtail their risk is by making it hard, if not impossible, to collect on these policies. So that's why we oftentimes see this wording in the group disability insurance policy setting. While we're talking about group insurance, let's talk about some of the differences between group policies and individual policies. Taxation. Typically, group policies are taxable upon receipt, whereas individual policies are typically tax-free if you need to collect. Portability. Group policies typically stay behind if you change jobs or employers. Whereas individual policies, you're going to put them in your pocket and this policy is going to go with you from job A to job B to job C, from state A to state B to state C. It's yours and you're going to bring it with you for the next 20 or 30, maybe even 40 years. Contract language. We'd alluded to this on the previous page. Essentially, the wording and features of individual policies are much stronger than group policies because these insurance companies, when you get an individual policy, they know, they meaning the insurance company, they know who they're aligning themselves with for the next 20 or 30 or 40 years. Whereas group policies, they have no idea who they're aligning themselves with, but they do know that there's plenty of people that are covered under the group policy that would not be otherwise eligible to get a comprehensive individual policy. So they scale back the wording in those group policies. And coverage amounts and caps. Uh, this can be very uh, misleading um, or confusing. And this, this really doesn't come into play until you are an attending physician. Let's just, uh, we'll use some round numbers. You know, let's say you're an attending physician and you're making say $500,000 and you sign up for your benefits package and your employer says, okay, you're making $500,000. Your group disability insurance covers you for 60% of your income. Well, you're thinking, you know, 60% of $500,000, $300,000, that's not bad when it comes to disability insurance. If God forbid something were to happen, well, it's too good to be true. So they may say 60%, but on the next line or on the next page, it's going to say 60% with a cap of X. So a lot of times we'll say 60% cap or 60% with a cap of say 5,000 or 60% with a cap of 10,000. So if you really put your thinking hat on, 60% with a cap of five or $10,000, which would then be subject to tax. So it's really 60% that would be $4,000 a month or maybe $8,000 a month that you would need to you know, be virtually in a coma to collect on. Group insurance isn't that good. Uh, once again, all the more reason why you want to have a comprehensive individual policy that sits in first position. And then if they give you a group policy, make sure it layers behind that, um, that, that group policy or that individual policy, I should say. And these individual policies for residents and fellows, you're not going to go broke buying them, you know, depending on several factors. Um, you can, oftentimes get your foot in the door for somewhere around a hundred dollars a month, you know, sometimes a, a bit more, sometimes a bit less, but think of a hundred dollars a month as um, just a, 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 um, a price point to be able to get your, your foot in the door as a resident or a fellow on a policy. There's different types of disability policies. There's short-term policies and there's long-term policies. 
Short-term policies typically kick in when you're out of work for a week or two, and they may pay out for three to six months. Whereas long-term policies, they typically do not kick in until you're out of work for three to six months. And assuming you trip the litmus test, which, which could be a whole other issue, but um, assuming you, you overcome that litmus test, maybe it can collect until the age of 65 or 67. Aside from own occupation, the other most important feature within a disability insurance policy is what I refer to as the balloon option. The balloon option is the ability to increase your coverage amount at a later date without having to answer any medical questions based upon whatever your health is today. So right this minute, everybody knows what their health is. However, nobody can tell me what their health is going to be in three, five, seven, ten years from now. So assuming you're in favorable health now and you go to get a policy, if the insurance company offers you this balloon option, you are putting that company on the hook to give you more coverage at a later date without having to answer any medical questions. This is worth its weight in gold. And this is the number one reason why you want to get a policy as early as you possibly can. And when I say as early as you possibly can, I have a tremendous amount of that are graduating in four or five months, actually uh, inquiring about disability insurance as we speak. So it's never too soon to get a policy. Now, it's also important to understand that every insurance policy in every company has different wording and features within their policy. And some companies have very good balloon options and other companies have extremely scaled back balloon options. And there are several policies on the market today where these balloon options are, are so scaled back. I actually want nothing to do with the policies and I will not offer them to my clients. So on an individual basis, we can talk about which policies have very good balloon options and which companies uh, are very scaled back with regard to this feature. Insurance policies, pricing and wording are regulated on a state by state basis. There's 46 states where things are the same and then there's four states where things are different and not in a good way. So the four states where things are different are Florida, California, Arizona, and Nevada. So if you're in one of those 46 states and you know you're going to one of those four states, please get your policy prior to going there. In the event you're in one of those four states uh, and you know you're imminently leaving, I never want you to wait to get a policy, but talk to me or talk to another insurance professional and we can talk about um, wherever you are, wherever you're moving, what the policy differences are, what the policy um, pricing um, uh, differences may be. And then maybe you have a decision to make whether or not to, to get a policy now or, uh, or wait a few months until you have a foot out the door. And in the event that you previously got a policy while in one of those four states, and now you are not in one of those states. Maybe it makes sense to look at that policy again and find out if you can find, if you can um, secure a more robust policy for the same or less money. Medical underwriting. So naturally, when you go to get a policy, the insurance company, they're going to want to know about your current health, about pre-existing conditions, about surgeries, about family history. They also want to know what is in that pharmacy database. So they're going to do a run of that database and see what kind of scripts are attached to your name. Please, whatever you do, do not self-prescribe or have friends, family members, or loved ones prescribe you meds. Now, there's certain 
scenarios that we can overcome. You know, for example, let's say you are traveling abroad and you want to get something in case you get a stomach bug. We can overcome that. But if there's mental health medica or mental health medi medications, excuse me, um, that are prescribed by friends, family members, or loved ones without proper documentation on those medications, it makes it very hard, if not impossible, to get a policy. So please do not self-prescribe or, or have friends, family members, or loved ones give meds that fall into that mental health arena. And many insurance companies uh, do not require blood and urine to, to secure policies nowadays, if you're a resident or a fellow. From time to time, we'll come across what I would refer to as no medical question, questions asked insurance policies. Now, there's a time and a place for these. If you have a serious pre-existing condition that would limit your ability to get a decent policy, that would be a great opportunity to take advantage of one of these policies if it's um, available at your respective institution. And there's very, very few institutions where, where these types of policies are available. Now, if you are in good health or you have very, very little going on from a health standpoint, don't get scared into taking one of these policies because these policies are scaled back in wording, features, they oftentimes cost more money. Um, it, it's not in your best interest if you're, if you're in favorable health. So there's a time and a place and once again on an individual basis, if you want to discuss your specific situation, we can and uh, I have access to these types of policies in, in many institutions. And if I don't have access, sometimes I know about other insurance professionals that, that may have access to something that I do not. So reach out to me, we can discuss your situation, and I can tell you, uh, the, you know, the, if it would be uh, a favorable option for you or, or not to take advantage of one of these policies. Financial underwriting, it's very easy to secure a policy as a resident or a fellow. Uh, with most companies, you can secure as much as $5,000 per month of coverage. And if you're on the back end of your training and or you have an executed employment contract on hand, we can uh, oftentimes get you higher coverage amounts. We talked about many of these items. Uh, the, the most important reason uh, to lock in a policy sooner rather than later is for that balloon option. We know, or you know, I should say, what your health is today, but nobody knows what your health is going to be in the future. So by getting a, a, a small policy now with that balloon option, you're going to pay a little bit of money now, but you're going to put the insurance company on the hook to give you more coverage at a later date based upon whatever your health is today. That is far and away the most important reason to get a policy today rather than waiting till tomorrow or next year or two or three years from now. And I could spend about an hour and a half talking about this next block, but I'm not going to bore you with it. Um, what I can say is that Disability insurance policies, uh, are, there, there's a direct correlation between policy wording and policy pricing. You do not want to price shop for disability insurance because I could show you a policy that costs $80 a month, another one that costs 90 and another one that costs 100 And once you fully understand what the differences are between the policies, uh, that cost 80, 90, and 100, you're probably not going to get that $80 policy and likely not that $90 policy either. Um, there's too many insurance professionals out there where they don't know what they're selling and they simply point to the lowest cost policy as if they are all the same thing. And that couldn't be any farther from the truth um, so you do not want to price shop for policies because this, the, the weaker policies are going to cost less. 
you need to get the policies um, that align with whatever your goals and objectives are. And oftentimes these policies are going to cost a few bucks more. You know, it's not anything earth shattering, but they do cost a little bit more. Now, with that said, if you can get yourself a very comprehensive policy, uh, many of these insurance companies offer resident or fellowship discounts when you get a policy. That's a great thing, but simply don't um, uh, point your finger to the lowest price policy and get it just because it's the cheapest. Some of the red flags that I come across within the disability insurance arena, um, there's an epidemic out there going on with insurance professionals that have these like one page grids that map out five or six different policies. These grids are littered with incorrect information, misleading information, so on and so forth. It takes an insurance company 50 pages to map out one policy. So I don't quite understand how an insurance professional can properly and accurately map out five different policies on a one page matrix. If an insurance professional shows you one of these grids, start running fast, keep running as far as you possibly can and call up another insurance professional. You do not want to work with uh, a, a professional that um, does these grids. I, I refer to these grids or to these types of agents as, um, as, as, as spread sheeters because they don't know what they're selling. So they just map everything out. Um, and it's really like apples, oranges, kiwis, and pears, but they all throw them onto the same piece of paper as if they are all the same and they couldn't be, um, they're so different. So these grids, not a good thing. You do not want to engage the services of an insurance professional that only represents one insurance company. You want to engage the services of what they call independent insurance brokers, which is uh, what I am. I represent several companies with no ties or allegiance to any one specific company. If the cost seems too good to be true, it likely is. As I referred to on the last page, you do not want to buy the lowest price policy. You want to buy the policy that has the wording and features that goes with whatever your, your goals and objectives are for this policy. If anybody would like to block out some time, whether it be to um, uh, discuss disability insurance or student loans or any other financial topics, feel free to go to my questionnaire at www.pgy1.com. It takes about a minute or two. There's probably 10 or 15 questions on there, and then we can block out some time confidentially to discuss your situation. You can also uh, go ahead and scan this QR code and, and it'll show up on your, on your telephone or, or tablet. And once again, everything we discuss is absolutely confidential. <clears throat> so I'll give you a second to scan this. Now, furthermore, if anybody has an insurance policy they would like me to do a review on, I don't charge fees or anything like that. It takes me two minutes. I can look at a policy. I can tell you if it's favorable or not. When it comes to financial planning for residents and fellows, there's really five topics uh, that you all need to rank respective to your specific situation. Student loans, disability insurance, purchasing a home, life insurance, and retirement planning. Typically, coming up with a strategy on student loans and securing a comprehensive individual disability insurance policy are going to be atop the list. So I challenge everybody to rank these items one, two, three, four, and five, and please address them by order of priority. If a Roth IRA happens to be four or five on your priority list and you haven't addressed one, two, th or three, you may want to um, uh, rethink this. And 
I think it's a great opportunity from a cash flow standpoint for residents and fellows because now that they've extended the CARES Act modifications for the next nine months, there's possibly an extra three or four hundred dollars that might have been carved out in your budget up until uh, March of this past year um, that maybe you can reallocate towards uh, what, whatever it might be um, in, in your uh, priority for, for a financial plan. So uh, rank these topics and uh, if you want to discuss any of these topics, I'm more than happy to discuss them with you. I would like to thank everybody for logging on to this webinar. I want to thank you also for doing what you do in this uncertain and crazy time. Uh, <clears throat> if you feel that a lecture on these topics would be beneficial to your respective program, please reach out to me. I speak to over 100 programs a year and we can most certainly get something on the books for your program. So I'm going to end it uh, now. I want to thank everybody for logging on. Hopefully you picked up some, some valuable information and if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. Thank you.